Good morning to our audience in North America. Good afternoon to our audience across Europe and in Belarus. I'm Damon Wilson, Executive Vice President at the Atlantic Council. And I'd like to welcome you all to AC Front Page, our premier live ideas platform for global leaders. We are honored today to be hosting a truly courageous and inspiring global leader, Belarusian opposition leader Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya, for her first public program in Washington. After her husband was jailed by Belarusian dictator Alexander Lukashenko while running for president, Svetlana stepped in. Running a historic campaign for change, much of the world recognizes that she overwhelmingly won the August 9th election. But Sikhanovskaya was forced to flee the country after the regime threatened her family. The people of Belarus have protested for months demanding that Lukashenko resign. They are the true source of legitimacy. Sikhanovskaya and the Coordination Council for the Transition of Power, which she leads from Vilnius, Lithuania, is recognized by the European Union and many others as the true voice of the Belarusian people. The courage and resilience displayed by the people of Belarus in the face of authoritarian brutality cannot be emphasized enough. Thousands are constantly showing up week after week and now even in the cold to demand change and the right to determine their own future. Lukashenko's security forces are violently beating protesters, illegally detaining people and brutally torturing and killing innocent people. Svetlana Sukhanaevskaya has shown immense bravery and determination, working to rally global support for the people of Belarus and to ensure that Lukashenko and those who brutalize peaceful protesters are held accountable for their crimes. We are honored that she joins us today and understand the importance and urgency of keeping attention on the people of Belarus and their struggle for freedom. Our very own Melinda Herring, the Deputy Director of our Atlanta Council's Eurasia Center and a champion of freedom in the region will moderate today's conversation. But first we're going to turn to Franek Viachorka, an advisor to Svetlana Sukhanovskaya and a non-resident fellow at the Atlanta Council to introduce our guest. Franek, thank you for your own analysis, your own voice and your own courage. And I wanna thank again, everyone in our audience for joining us. Franek, let me turn it over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Damon, for such a warm introduction, and uh, I'm really happy the Atlantic Council is hosting this event. Uh, this is very important for Belarus, this is very important for Eastern Europe, that we are discussing the, um, uh, the, the, the problem of, of my personal country, but also this uh, situation is very important for entire Europe. We see that Belarusians are struggling for democracy, for free and fair elections, but also for human dignity. Uh, six months ago, Svetlana was not a professional politician, but since then she really became such. And right now she is the leader of all the people in Belarus who believe that uh, this country must be free and uh, democratic. Uh, Svetlana Tsikhanovska is living now in exile in Vilnius. Uh, um, uh, she has a very strong team. Um, some of her team members are also fellows at Atlantic Council, which is uh, it was quite symbolic as well. And um, me personally, I'm very happy to work with Svetlana because she demonstrates courage and she inspires uh, uh, our fellow Belarusians as well. I also, I'm also very happy that Melinda uh, will be moderating this conversation. And Melinda is the deputy director of the Eurasia Center at Atlantic Council. And um, I, pass, um, um, I pass the floor to, to you, Melinda. Thank you, Veronik. It's really a pleasure to work with you. It's now my honor to welcome Svetlana Tikhanovskaya to the Atlantic Council. We have been waiting and waiting to speak with you. Welcome, Svetlana. So I would like to ask you, we are endlessly inspired by the Belarusian people. They've come out to the street for months now protesting Lukashenko's brutal regime. But things seem to be at a stalemate. There don't seem to be enough breaks in the security services to change things. The crowds are still strong. How can the people of Belarus change the dynamic on the ground and force out Lukashenko? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I have to say that people of uh, Belarus demonstrate amazing determination in the peaceful fight for change. 
You know, currently the protest embraced the, represented, the representatives of various professions, uh, ages and society groups. Uh, for example, yesterday the police detained the 17-year-old Holocaust survivor Larisa Sous and 73-year-old activist Nina Bahinskaya, just because uh, these brave women dared to raise their voice against the violence. So from, um, from uh, what I can see, the regime specifically targets journalists uh, who are showing the truth about the atrocities. Each week, reporters are being arrested. And now at least 373 journalists have been detained, with six of them are still remaining in prisons. Medics, uh, teachers, academic and factory workers suffer for their position as well. And the Lukashenko regime uh, brutally punishes people for expressing their opinion. However, this doesn't stop these people from participating in the protest. Uh, when uh, going for protest, people bring first necessity items they might need in prison if uh, detained. Uh, I think the seeming monolith of uh, the security forces started breaking under the pressure of the civic movement. Uh, for example, uh, the initiative by Paul, uh, launched by a former policeman, regularly publishes information leaks uh, discrediting the highest officials. Uh, the activists launch multiple initiatives, one of them re-education of the security offices. Also, they create local decision-making centers, um, some of uh, which may serve as self-governing uh, bodies in New Belarus. Uh, Belarusians have been living under state terror for months. The price they are paying for their peaceful fight is too high. We are asking the West to act faster. Uh, in my opinion, Western countries uh, should uh, demand new and fair elections and release of all political prisoners. Belarus Democracy Act would serve as timely and extremely helpful step from the head of the U.S. government in support of the brave people of Belarus. Thank you, Svetlana. Many observers have noticed and been surprised that the protesters have lasted for months and they show no signs of slowing down. In the past, there's been a lot of protests around elections, but they've lasted only for days or weeks. What's different this time? You know, I think this um, peaceful aspiration towards democracy matured for 26 years. And now the Belarusian people will not stop uh, until Lukashenko resigns. Uh, he is considered responsible for the mass falsifications, violence and lies in response to the dangers of COVID-19 pandemic. And this time people's patience came to an end. The protest mood is so strong that even the brutal beatings and the tortures are not able to destroy them. Uh, you know, Belarusians have managed to form a strong network of solidarity. There is no way back. According to the um, latest polls, uh, Belarusians are prepared to protest as long as it is necessary. And I'm sure that we will reach the main goal to conduct new presidential elections. I have never seen such a level of determination and resilience. Also, the Western countries took a unified position against the Lukashenko regime, inducing sanctions and other measures to stop the violence in Belarus. Such support, of course, inspires the protest in Belarus. It serves as uh, additional evidence that the West shares the aims and the values of uh, our movement. Absolutely. That, that's really encouraging. Lukashenko recently said he might quit after a new constitution is adopted. What do you make of that promise? Will Lukashenko step down? Oh, I don't think that Lukashenko will step down, will step voluntarily. This is a hypocritical statement on behalf of a man who consolidated 
authoritarian power back in the 1990s after conducting an unconstitutional referendum. He practically gave himself unlimited powers. So by, um, by talking about the new constitution, uh, Lukashenko attempts to buy himself time to justify his staying power. You know, historically, it has been quite a um, typical strategy for the authoritarian leaders who are reluctant to give up on power. So there is no trust to Lukashenko promises about constitution and new elections. All his promises are fake and Belarusian people know this. So this rhetoric is used to uh, deceive the West. Lukashenko attempts to uh, create an appearance of national dialogue. There um, could be no trust in such moves as the people who are appointed for such a dialogue among the political prisoners still have criminal charges pending against them. That is why uh, we remain committed to our basic demand. Lukashenko must go. Belarus needs new free and fair elections alongside with the constitutional reform based on the constitution of uh, 1994. Uh, Belarusian democratic forces together with top Belarusian lawyers are now developing a draft of the new constitution which would entail best international practices. Wonderful. That was a very clear list. Thank you very much. So Svetlana, let's talk about Moscow now. Moscow is definitely involved uh, and, and we know that they have helped prop up Lukashenko. Uh, they've sent significant financial aid. They've also sent uh, Russian propagandists to go on Belarusian state TV. They're not neutral actors. But there's some indications that things may be changing between Moscow and Minsk. Is Moscow getting impatient with Lukashenko? What's your view on that? You know, uh, Russia is and has always been our close neighbor. And we don't have, um, you know, other choice than to work with it. The only thing we ask from Moscow uh, to withdraw support from Lukashenko. The longer Moscow silently approves the action of the dictator, the more it loses the credibility of the Belarusians. Uh, you know, on our end, we are open for a dialogue with Moscow and transparent about uh, our foreign policy prior priorities. We would welcome Moscow to, uh, you know, to talk about options for cooperation with respect to Belarus's sovereignty and national interest. And I want to underline that the protest in Belarus is not about uh, the geopolitical choices. It's about human dignity and willingness to live in the country with respect uh, for rule of law. So we stand for good relations with the East and West and intend to enhance ties with our neighbors. Thank you very much. Let's go back to Minsk now. Can you say more, how many people have been arrested since August 9th and how common is torture in prisons? Uh, it's a pity to admit, but uh, peaceful protesters are detained almost every day with law enforcement using brutal force. So since August, uh, since the 9th of August, more than 31,000 people have been detained. And there are at least eight protest-related deaths caused by excessive police violence against these peaceful protesters. And there are approximately, um, I think, 4,000 allegations of torture. Although not, uh, I have to admit that not a single criminal case has been opened concerning uh, human rights violation by uh, law enforcement officers. And more than 900 criminal cases have been brought against political opponents of the government. Lawyers uh, who provide help to the victims are, uh, you know, they are also at risk of intimidation by the authorities. So the legal system in Belarus is completely dysfunctional and it serves only like uh, the repressive machine. But the impunity will not last forever. 
because we have launched an, an initiative that is called uh, Book of Crimes, which allows to document the crimes of political abuse uh, verified by independent lawyers. The victims uh, described beatings, uh, prolonged uh, stress positions, electric shocks, and, um, and at least one case, rape. They had serious injuries, including broken bones, uh, cracked teeth, uh, skin wound, electrical burns, you know, and mild, uh, mild traumatic brain injuries. So we intend to use this book of crimes as evidence for future investigations uh, when Belarus restores the rule of law and also as a supporting evidence for expanded list of uh, international sanctions. Thank you very much. Uh, Svetlana, when you ran for president, you had two other women on your team. And one is a tall, blonde, fearless musician named Maria Klesnikova. Now she's in jail and she's being held on treason charges. She's very strong, she's very tough. Uh, how is she doing and what can the United States and the European Union do to help get her out of jail? Uh, you know, Maria is an um, outstanding and brave woman and she keeps a good spirit and, you know, in jail she, she keeps a good spirit and even manages to give interviews to international t newspapers from there. So yet I uh, strongly believe that the release of Maria Kalesnikova shouldn't be uh, considered in isolation from, the, from uh, the other issues. So necessity to stop brutal violence, resignation of Lukashenko and conduction of new transparent elections. So Lukashenko's regime um, has previously used the release of political prisoners as a tactical move uh, you know, in negotiations with the West. Uh, for example, he, he used the same trick as the leverage in the negotiations with the EU in uh, 2015, you know, to sway the EU at a time of growing domestic and geopolitical pressure. So I would like to encourage you to, you know, to avoid this trap and insist on release of all the political prisoners, stop of violence, of course, and resignation as the unconditional demand. Okay, I, I take your point, uh, but there's so little um, understanding of Belarus and of the people there that you have to uh, tell people's stories. You have to talk about your husband, you have to talk about Maria. Um, they can't just be um, names. So that, that's why we're using her sort of as a symbol. Um, let's get into specifics, please. Should the United States send an ambassador to Minsk now? What's your advice on that? Uh, we would welcome the U.S. decision to nominate an ambassador to Belarus. Um, it's crucial to have a diplomatic representative who, you know, who will focus on Belarus. However, we urge not to present diplomatic credentials to Lukashenko. Now, it's important to remember that Lukashenko is an illegitimate leader uh, and presenting credentials to him will legitimize him. So, and it will send a wrong signal to, to Belarus people, first of all. Okay. Okay, great. Look, I, I wanted to, to tell our audience if they haven't had a chance to get a copy of the Washington Post, uh, Ms. Tikhanovskaya has a piece in it this weekend. It's called, The People of Belarus Are Still Marching, Help Us. And she writes very passionately about the need to pass the Belarus Democracy, Human Rights and Sovereignty Act of 2020. There's two weeks left to pass this act before Congress is out. Uh, Ms. Tikhanovskaya, what's in it and why is it important? Uh, you know, um, we appreciate the bipartisan support received in favor of this act. We hope that uh, this draft bill uh, becomes law as soon as possible, as it would inspire the U.S. to act decisively and 
urgently to support Belarus. Belarusian peaceful protest is a turning point. People struggle, people suffer. Uh, people struggle, you know, every day with great dedication. Yet there is a need of support on behalf of uh, the international community. And when the new democratic democracy act becomes law, it would send a strong signal to the Belarusian regime and the rest of the world on non-recognition of Lukashenko's legitimacy, call for new presidential elections under OSCE standards and demand uh, the release of all political prisoners. You know, in our opinion, the act would allow prompt US assistance to the civil society, media and urgent actions such as countering internet blockages in Belarus. Great, thank you. What more can the European Union do to help the people of Belarus? Um, you know, I have to admit that it, now it is important that the US will uh, coordinate policy with the EU, Canada and the United Kingdom. So joint voice is more powerful. I also think that sanctions must be expanded. The uh, US should launch the procedure of acknowledging the police departments implementing the harsh crackdown on the protesters such as Amon and uh, Gubazik, uh, Gubopik as uh, terrorist groups. And it's crucial that um, the US start international investigation of police crimes. We are working now to make all possible there will not be impunity. Wonderful. Svetlana, is there anything else that you want to tell your audience here in the West? Uh, I just want to ask, be vocal about uh, Belarus at the moment, because we need uh, your help now. People are suffering every day now. This is our pain, and uh, I want you to pay as much attention to our country as you can because maybe it will be too late soon so please stay with us and uh, we will win thank you thank you so much thank you it was really a pleasure to speak with you the atlantic council will continue to follow belarus closely we can't wait to host you in washington you're always welcome and i'd like to thank our audience today for joining us I'd like to invite you tomorrow, there will be another event on Belarus. It will be with Franek Vichorka, Dr. Michael Carpenter, Ambassador John Herbst, and I'll be your moderator. That event is tomorrow at 12.30 to 1.30 Eastern Standard Time, and we'll get more into the details of what's happening on the streets of Minsk now. Now, these things never happen with one person, so I'd like to thank Franek's team. Thank you, Ms. Svetlana Tikhanovskaya. It was really a pleasure, and thank you to the entire team at the Atlantic Council. Until tomorrow, we look forward to seeing you at 12.30. Until then, thank you very much for your time and attention. Bye-bye. Thank you, goodbye.